but I thought I'd go through a couple of things because I don't know anything about Wikipedia, but there are some things that probably should be fixed in Wikipedia on a couple of different people's wikis because I don't have a wiki page myself and my dad doesn't have a wiki page, which baffles me why he wouldn't. Um, anyway, there's a guy uh, named Tony Freer that's doing, uh, he's looking for like lost Eddie Cochran tapes. And I know a couple of people that might have something like that. I don't know. Uh, supposedly, all of the tapes ended up in um, Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, I'm not sure who ended up with those tapes. But somebody probably got those at a garage sale or something. A box of reel-to-reels. And there might be some Eddie Cochran music that nobody's ever heard before. Possibly some Cochran Brothers stuff, too. Um... I thought maybe I might have something from back then because he did play guitar for my dad in 1953-54. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of things. So um, let me see what I got here. Okay. A couple of things. So this is my dad on Okinawa. He's holding the mandolin. Uh, that's in 1945. Because uh, he was in Okinawa at the end of World War II. He actually drove heavy equipment stuff, built airstrips. It was in the Army Air Corps. So that was in, uh, that was in Okinawa. Okay. And then, um, uh, let's see. You can't really see it, but in this picture is all the gear that they had back in the, uh, that's probably around 1960. Two maybe. Anyway, this picture. This is a picture of my dad um, back in uh, at KXLA in Pasadena in 1953. He had a radio show. Uh, Win Stewart. This is the earliest known picture of Win Stewart, actually. In fact, this picture I gave this to Mick Buck when he was uh, curator of the uh, Bakersfield exhibit at the Country Music Hall of Fame. I gave him an actual picture. Uh, the other guy in there, that's Billy D. But Dad was the star of that particular Happy Hoedowner show or whatever it was called. I can't remember what he called it. Uh, and then uh, his Local 47 card, because he was in the Musicians Union. And that's Local 47, Hollywood, California. He was a life member. And he also was a member of uh, Houston Musicians Protective Association, which is pretty interesting, because he left... He left in 55 and went to Arkansas, and uh, I think he said it was like KBBA or something like that. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to go back through and listen to him. But he he had, he had did radio shows. Everybody was trying to vying for radio shows back then. And, um, and Dad had put out a record in 1953. It was released, and... Um, and it was actually a 78. There were three sides. There were three songs that were recorded, but the 78 came out, and it came out with this song, When I Hold You. And if you look really close, it's written by Owens, Lee, and Stewart. That's because this is the first record that Buck Owens ever played on. Um, and he co-wrote the song with my dad and with Cleet Stewart. And then on the flip side of this is I Can't Live Without You Now. Let's see if you can see that. And that was solely written by my dad. So was Higher, Higher, and Higher, which was put out as a single as well on the Chesterfield label. So, anyway, dad never got his royalties from that. The gal that uh, put this whole thing together and signed my dad to that record label... She somehow started another record label and she took all the rest of the tapes. That was the first recording session that Buck Owens did. Um, Dad brought everybody over from Bakersfield. He liked the band, you know, because they were, they were playing honky-tonk music. He dug them. Everybody was kind of getting hip to the Buck thing. Dad was the first guy to actually take them in the studio and, and turn them on to everybody else. And then he started backing up Tommy Collins and all that. Uh, but on this Buck Owens record, which on the La Brea label, which this thing came out in 1960 after he'd already signed, after Buck had already signed with Capitol. But if you read, if, you, if you've got a copy of this, at the, the back of it, you read that it says, we've included an interview with Forrest Lee and Cleet Stewart. So there's an actual interview with my dad and Cleet Stewart 
uh, talking about Buck. And then my dad's actually singing the last three songs on this record because they're his, they're his songs. So anyway, what I'm getting at is he, uh, neither of them got paid. And dad and Buck both, uh, I think they said they went to Gang Tire and Brown to, to try to get it resolved. That's who was Buck's attorney. Um, and try to get that thing off the market because Buck was starting to take off with the early stuff. This is before the Don Rich era. This was like um, uh, Above and Beyond and uh, Under Your Spell Again and stuff like that. So second fiddle. The cool early Buck stuff before he hooked up with Don Rich. Before he went up to Tacoma and discovered Don. Anyway, so you know, after the recording sessions, Dad needed a guitar player that was pretty good, so he hired this kid, Eddie Cochran, who was starting to get pretty good. And Eddie always had that Gretsch. Everybody's seen pictures of him with that Gretsch guitar. Well, the story behind that guitar, which nobody ever really gets right, my dad's the one who actually bought that guitar from Bell Gardens Music while he was playing, while Eddie was playing lead guitar for my dad. And this all happened through Warren Flock, who had met my dad uh, at one of those talent show um, something. I don't know. Anyway, dad was, he had a radio show on, on KXLA in, in Pasadena at the time. And KXLA also did uh, like a hayride type show, like uh, the Happy Hoedowner show. Everybody had their own, uh, Cliffy Stone's hometown jamboree. There were a bunch of different things like that. Uh, but they did one that had Merle Travis on it all the time. Jimmy Bryant was on it all the time. And Dad was pretty good friends with uh, Jimmy Bryant and Merle Travis, actually. So anyway, so Warren Flock introduced Dad to Eddie, and Dad hired Eddie. Now, in this uh, in this thing here, let me see. i got to find some glasses because since I had that cataract lens put in, I can't see says in here, uh, in this particular one. It's cool because I knew that this existed. I just, I have never been able to find it. And this this guy, Tony Freer, who's who's been uh, pestering me for any interview stuff and and uh, if I have any information on Eddie Cochran because he's writing a book or something and he's trying to put out another record. I don't know. Um, and it says, uh, in here it says, Warren Flock was another early associate of Eddie's. Uh, blah, blah, blah. In early 50... Uh, let's see. Warren probably met him at the Bell Gardens Music Center in early 53, where Eddie had a part-time job, which is in the broader context of the Eddie Cochran story, an interesting and noteworthy point. Okay. So, my dad lived in Bellflower, um, in Bell Gardens, Garden Grove, all of those areas. I've got family all over that area right there. And my dad moved... My dad moved to California in 1950 or 51, I think he moved in 1950 with uh, Sheriff Tex, who had his own TV show and everything up in Seattle. Anyway, he brought my dad down, and dad decided to stay and try to get a deal, and he did. He got a radio show. He got a record deal um, doing his thing. So, uh, But in, in, this, in, this pamphlet, in this book here, it says, it could explain how Eddie managed to purchase a brand-new Gretsch guitar that would remain with him for the rest of his career. Could Eddie have obtained this famous Gretsch at a favorable price from the store owner and helped pay for it from his music store wages? No, he couldn't. How he got that guitar was Dad bought that guitar and took the payments of $12.50 a week out of Eddie's weekly pay when he was playing for my dad. And another guy that Dad would, would take with him every once in a while on the road was Hank Cochran. Um... And another backstory to that, Hank sang I Fall to Pieces to my dad in the back of a Cadillac in like 1954 on the way to a gig somewhere, like years before it came out. Um, so he already had that song in the bag before he met Harlan Howard. And dad and Harlan were friends too, and dad and Buck remained friends throughout history. But um, back to this, you know, when it comes down to this part here... It could explain how Eddie managed to purchase this brand new Gretsch guitar. That doesn't explain it. The The true explanation that I've been told my entire life, like Dad told me this when I was 12, is that he bought that guitar for Eddie and took the payments out of his paycheck. $12.50 a week. 
And then a little bit later on uh, in the next paragraph, it says, um, uh, along with Warren and bass player Dave Corman, Eddie formed the uh, short-lived uh, Bell Gardens Ranch Gang in summer of 1953. Now, this is right about the time he ended up going to work for my dad and Cleet Stewart. Um, cause dad had a hot new record out at that point and he had a radio show and he was starting to tour. So, uh, the gang undertook local gigs as well as several radio and TV shows. Later that year, Warren appeared in a local talent contest for musicians where he met Forrest Lee Bibby, a fiddle player. <laughs> My dad was not a good fiddle player. Uh, he was a front man and a booking agent and, uh, anybody that knew my dad, they knew he had the gift of gab and he was, he was a booking agent and a front man and he, he sounded like rubbing two washed up singing, but I mean, he had a unique voice. So that kind of worked. Um, but that's where he met Forrest Lee Bibby. That's my real last name is Bibby, just in case anybody didn't know that. Um, so that's where he met Forrest Lee and, uh, Cleet Stewart who sang and played guitar. Soon after Warren introduced them to Eddie and Dave. And Warren Flock remembers piling into Corman's 1953 Ford sedan and heading up to the Bakersfield area in an attempt to find live airplay on any radio station they could uh, that would give them the time of day. Unfortunately, that collaboration faltered soon after the group returned. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but for about a year, Eddie and, uh, and Hank Cochran who dad also remained friends with his entire life. Um, they went out on the road playing with my dad and Cleet Stewart on gigs all over the place. They went up and down the California coast. They went out to the desert. Didn't matter wherever they could get gigs. So the, the history of that guitar right there and the mystery of that guitar, which I've tried to explain this to people before and they may or may not believe me. I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you what my dad told me. And this is about the closest example of anybody with any proof of the time frame because he did get that guitar before, technically before they came out. Because uh, A Country Gentleman wasn't even technically released until 55, but he got that guitar in either late 53 or early 54. So it was like an early, early guitar. Um but my dad is the one who bought that guitar, paid for it, took the payments out of Eddie's paycheck. $12.50 a week. Dad told me that's how much it was. He also told me Eddie liked to go rabbit hunting, so dad would take him out to the de desert and they'd shoot rabbits. Uh, and he loved eating shrimp. So if anybody's, you know, really that deep into Eddie Cochran, he loved shrimp. I love shrimp. I had it for dinner last night. Um... Anyway, that's kind of interesting. And this is the only the only little bit of evidence in any kind of print that I could find that even says Forrest Lee Bibby in association with Eddie Cochran. How crazy is that? That there's nothing in Wikipedia or any guitar magazines or anything, you know? And there's nothing about Dad and Buck Owens and that being Buck's first record. I don't know of anybody that's put anything in there. I don't have a Wikipedia page. I've tried to figure that stuff out, but I don't know anything about it. Um, so that was just, you know, my interesting little tidbit of information. I, uh, it's always been a pet peeve of mine that that I haven't been able to, to find any information on that. And I've been wanting to write a book about my dad, but all of his friends are passing away. And, and you know, the only family members that are left that would even remember any of this stuff is my mom. And maybe a couple of my cousins, but, um, you know, they're getting few and far between, too. Um, I, I have been interviewing my mom a little bit and asking her some questions on stuff like this. In fact, this guy that sent me that CD, um, he, I'm not sure if he's from England or he's in Canada or where he's at. Um, but anyway, I gave Tony my mom's number. I said, you could try calling my mom and... And uh, my cousin Kay was the Eddie Cochran fan club president. So maybe one of my cousins, one of Kay's family, one of Kay's kids might know something or have some information. I don't know. Um, but I know that she was the president of the fan club. And uh, she lived in Garden Grove. Or actually, did she live in Garden Grove? Or 
I think they lived in Garden Grove, California, or no, instead of Bell Gardens. But Bell Gardens, Bellflower Garden Grove, that whole area. Um, anyway, I thought that was that needed to be said. And uh, the other thing I'm trying to figure out, and maybe one of you can help me decipher this, because I've sent letters to the Orchard, which is run by Sony, but I've been posting. Uh, I've been posting songs off of this, which this 78, I mean, this is way before Buck ever had a record deal. This came out in 1953. Um, that record came out in 1953. I don't know if they recorded it in 52 or early 53, but it came out in 1953. And it hit the charts in 1953. Um, the Buck Owens stuff didn't come out until 1960. Also, another thing, that song, When I Hold You, if you listen to that song and you listen to the Mexican polka right against each other, it's the same song. My dad and Cleet and Buck wrote that song. Later on, Buck removed Dad and Cleet's name from it and uh, just called it the Mexican Polka. And then he put it out on his Year For Me album and then again released it on his uh, uh, Buck Owens and the Buckaroos Instrumentals album. So, there's one more year to get that rectified. And I tried, I talked to Tor Troy Tomlinson. Me and Dad actually went to Sony Tree 25 years ago. And talked to Troy Tomlinson and tried to get this rectified. And it's like, hey man, we got to get this straight because my dad's a co-writer on that song. So we need to figure the, figure this out. And he said, nobody's buying that stuff anymore. Like, it's not worth our time. And I'm thinking, well, technically it is worth our time because what if something changes in the future? Like right now, we have YouTube. So if I post my dad's music on YouTube which I just did last week with his album, his recording from his record deal that I own the copyrights to uh, and control his music catalog through BMI because after he passed away, four years of you know going through all the rigmarole, I am the executor of his account, basically. I. I take care of all my dad's royalties. If he if he has anything in film and TV or any royalties from stuff like YouTube, it gets distributed to me, and I distribute it to my two siblings. So, because uh, it goes into our publishing company, Forest Lee Songs, uh, through BMI. Um, but when I post it on here, which this is probably going to get flagged for a copyright infringement too, because I'm going to play another one of my dad's songs that he's the sole writer of, as the background for this, and I might just loop it over and over again. If it gets flagged for copyright, we really need to get to the bottom of it and figure out why. Because that is my dad's music. He wrote that music, and somehow somebody else is getting the royalties from it, and that is just not acceptable. And if anybody knows who I need to talk to, because I've been trying to get through to BMI. It's nearly impossible. I don't know what's going on with BMI right now. I think they got sold or something. Um, which is crazy to me. But uh, if anybody has any idea of who I can talk to, maybe Buck's kids. Maybe Buddy will like hook me up with the, the right person to talk to so that we can get this resolved. Because the Mexican polka should be a co-write. That should also have Cleet Stewart's name on it and Forrest Lee Sr., Forrest Lee Bibby. And uh, the other two songs that are on that other Bucket, Buck Owens record, they are also not right. So we need to figure it out. Anyway, like, subscribe. Uh, if you made it all the way through this video, thank you very much for, for uh, watching it all the way through. Um, I really appreciate all you guys, and I really need help trying to figure this out. So if you know somebody, let me know.